Um, I see you've been uh, you you branching out into uh, drawing. Um, <laughs> yeah, with your zine, how's that going? Um, quite well. Uh, yeah, I thought it would be a nice way to force myself to do things a bit more quickly, um, and not be such a perfectionist. Um, but it hasn't been. Uh, it's like oh, really? I thought. It, 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 you know, have you heard of a zine? I, I know. I know. Yeah. I don't, yeah, because I, sometimes yeah. I say to people and they're like, what's a zine? I've never heard of that. And I feel like I've always known what a zine was. So I guess it's one of those things some people just aren't countercultural enough and have never read a zine. <laughs> but um, I thought like if I label it a zine, then it almost has to be very casual. Um, yeah. But of course, I've ended up laboring over the next one for weeks and weeks. And uh, so, um, but yeah, it, it is helping me to do something that if I it would have taken a lot longer otherwise, I think. Um, just yeah. to, um, I, I tried something similar a while ago. I've been, I, I don't sketch a lot, but every now and again, I think, I, oh, I need to sketch more. And so I've done this thing where I give myself a five minute by five minute schedule to draw something. So yeah. um, I've got five minutes to, uh, to sketch it and then five minutes to color it. Yeah. And I found it super useful because before I'd sit down and, and sketching was this like project. It had to be a thing. Um, yeah. And so I, I would, you know, I'd never have the time yeah. um, to, to do this thing, but I've always got 10 minutes. Yeah. Um, and so that's kind of a, um, I don't know, a little, a little mind trick where um, I, you know, for, for 10 minutes, anyone, anyone can sit down and draw for 10 minutes and mm. I'm not allowed to go beyond that. So I'm not allowed to improve it. Once I hit my five minutes, I've got to be done with the pencil. And then five minutes after that, I've got to be done with the yeah. colors. So yeah. it's been, it's nice been going well. Yeah. I like that. You're drawing in, because I know you're, you're very technologically, technologically adept, but you're drawing with a pencil and paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Pencil, yeah. paper, graph, like charcoal or, or whatever. Yeah. I'm so good idea. I should, I should probably try that. Um, to, yeah, I, to, to kind of put some sort of limit on the perfectionism is like a very um self-flattering way of describing describing it oh i'm such a perfectionist it's probably <laughs> it's definitely a vice it's definitely not a good thing um, yeah, yeah yeah i wonder if it's fear is it is it fear like um you know of of sharing this and it's not not good enough you haven't hit some standard uh i think it, i think it's um if i really think about it it's probably a a good way of putting it yeah but again like i don't know i don't really have any, m many coherent thoughts on it except there's probably a healthy th fear i think like in the at the end of the day i, I think especially because it's actually about something quite important which is you know clinical practice and and people's pain and stuff you do actually have to get it right um yeah uh but I, that doesn't stop me being a, a bit kind of disappointed that you know, I thought I thought that this would be a quicker way to work because at the end of the day, I fundamentally know what I want to say. Um, but in, to reference it and make sure all the kind of edge cases are covered and, and all this stuff that you have to do. Because talking about assessment of sciatica, um, it just takes time. Plus, like I don't really, I'm not the, I don't know everything there is to know about it, so I have to talk to people and check with them. And stuff. Yeah. So is this is this supposed to be a supplement to the to the writing, or just a different way of communicating the same information? Uh, uh, I think it was yeah the second yeah a bit of both really. So uh, I I realized that well I, I want to communicate something about assessment, um, but then the more I thought about it, the more I realized it it wasn't enough to be in a book. Uh, it would be a very small book so you think oh, okay well maybe you put it in a book assessment and treatment but then what I was hoping to do with the treatment one actually was to uh, treatment maybe management is a better word but is to make it readable for both the clinician and the layperson I don't know if it's possible but I'd love to make it uh, like uh, aim it at both because I think it would be just much more useful that that way um and in that case, you can't put in stuff about assessment because it, it just really would um, distract from the purpose of the book. Like if, if you are not a clinician and you pick up a book about sciatica and it starts off about differentiating from neuralgia parasitica, like it's not that interesting. Um, yeah, yeah. So, I, okay, so I thought, okay, I have to do something 
no one wants another blog post or infographic. Um, so I don't know really where I got the idea for a zine it eventually came up, but yeah, that's how process of elimination. I was like, this is probably the best way to do it. And yeah. an assessment hopefully would be very visual as well, right? Like, you know, it's yeah. not only little, little diagrams and arrows here and there and everywhere and boxes and stuff. Um, but yeah, the, the first one was very su successful. Like, I, you know, I did like a test one and it was just available for free. And um, that's been very popular. Um, okay. So, yeah, it's different, I think. Yeah. So, it's so much of clinical writing is so stagnant and boring. Like, it's just utterly boring. Um, and I remember so seeing... Boring. Yeah. Years ago now, I saw a, um, a PhD thesis um, as a graphic novel. Um, and it wasn't a thesis that was turned into a graphic novel. It was submitted as a graphic novel. Mm -hmm. And it kind of introduced me to this idea that scholarship and scholarly practice um, and, and communicating ideas doesn't have to be text-based. And I still privilege text just because that's uh, something that I'm far more comfortable with. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I love the idea that uh, people are starting to experiment with you know, sharing ideas, communicating ideas, scholarly ideas that are, you know, rigorous and, you know, grounded in evidence um, in, in different ways and for different audiences. So that's really exciting. I really hope it takes off. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see. Um, yeah. Hopefully so. No. <laughs> I'm just how's, uh, how, I was just going to say, how's, how's the book doing now that you've, you've launched and it's been available for a while? It's good. It's doing well. Yeah. Um, not, selling like hot cakes just steadily which was the kind of um this is the quarter quina one um and it was um it's uh the aim of it of it was we're hoping it sounds a little arrogant but it will become the standard text because um well there isn't really another competing text there isn't really this um obviously some papers out there and things but there's there's nothing out out there that does what we've done with the book which is not only tell you about the research and about the thing, but how to do the thing, <laughs> how to actually put it all into practice. Um, so we're, that the aim was not to um, kind of take the world by storm, but for it to become yeah the, the standard text. And, and yeah. um, only time will tell if that happens. Um, but so far, like the feedback is really good. Uh, it's selling like steadily. Um, yeah, yeah. Whereas the sciatica one sold very, very quickly and then tailed off as, as most books do. This one is kind of just doing a steady line. And um, I put no effort at all into selling or marketing it, which I really need to do. Um, but yeah, it's very nice to have it kind of done. That's the first one I've got because the sciatica one was always all kind of provisional. Like it was a PDF. It was a bit scrappy. I finished it the, the day before I shipped it out you know and and this one is much more polished and um so it's really nice to have that kind of done it's in in the in the bag now um and you know just onward you know cool. so okay, when you um so i mean the, the purpose of this conversation is i really wanted to know a little bit more about your process for writing because mm -hmm. there's very few academics who i know who um who who, who blog who are on, you know, Substack, you know, you're talking about zines, you're drawing, you've got books. Um, so you obviously, you would need to be thinking about writing quite a lot. And um, uh, I, don't, I don't know this for sure, but I think you probably have a slightly different process to the way that most academics think about it. You know, you've mentioned the fact that academic writing tends to be, you know, not super exciting. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I just wanted to kind of pick your brains a little bit and, find out a little bit more about how you go about writing mm -hmm. um so i guess you know to start with i always want to know do you start a pen and paper or do you start outlining with an outliner um or or something else like where, where does it start you decide i'm going to write a book where does that start um i don't know and do anything on pen and paper anymore which is probably a bad thing but it's just i have i think we talked about before i have rome research which when we talked about it was very trendy and is now uh becoming like the <laughs> um like superseded by more trendy apps but um, i use room research and basically everything happens in there um so no pen and paper 
but Rome's really good for outlining, as you know, like it's very flexible and it's really easy to shift things around and change titles and subheadings and, and things like that. Um, and uh, in terms of, um, so let's see, with the quarter Aquina one, it was obviously I had a co-author who's really the subject matter expert clinically, like he's the one with all the clinical mileage under his belt. And we just um, started off with having like twice a week, a couple of hours of conversation. And we just talk about serious pathology in general. And then eventually we would find ourselves talking more and more about cord requiner syndrome. And then um, eventually we thought we'll write a book um, because, you know, I've already done that. And we didn't really think, you know, what we were doing was a course. Um, and so it ended up as a book. Um, so I guess it's all, that's all very kind of, um accidental type of thing um not casual because like obviously you have to think very hard about whether you want to do it and whether it's going to be worth it financially putting in the time and the business side of it but the fact that it was a book and it was about that was quite accidental um it just was what we were talking about and what we thought was most needed um and as for the writing process i think i just um did what on Rome in real life would be the equivalent of kind of putting your notes all across the floor type of thing. Um, so I opened up a, a tag for everything I could think of that was related to cord Aquinas syndrome and um, organized it until it looked like something, organized it again, organized it again, until it looked a bit more like a book. And then it certainly wasn't, sometimes when you hear people talk about Rome, it's like, or any of these note-taking apps, they oversell the the premise that your notes are there and you just have to organize them and then it becomes something magical that you can post. There's nothing like that. And but you know, it at least allows you to have a, a pile of notes about this thing and you kind of look at it and think, okay, and then you write something and then you look back at it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then the 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 key thing we did, um, well, there was a lot of shuffling around because what we didn't particularly want to do is, you know, talk about things like you want to avoid cliches in the micro sense, but also in the macro sense. And the, the, the cliche of any clinical writing is it starts off with cord requiner syndrome is a rare clinical condition affecting one in 10,000 people. It's caused, you know, so yeah, yeah. we wanted to avoid that. And so hopefully that we did a lot of shuffling to make the structure coherent but also somewhat novel it still follows a basic thing of this is what it is and so on but um but then the key thing i think we did was we used like the test reader process um so past a certain point probably later than we should have done i asked people on the newsletter do you want to read this and give us feedback um and we sent a, a very poor copy of the book it was awful um in hindsight i thought it was nearly there but in hindsight it was really not to 10 people and then like another 20 people and then 10 people more i think we did three rounds um and quite a structured thing where rather than saying tell me what you think i said highlight in green what you like highlight in red what you don't like comment whatever you want but just make sure you do the green and red thing um and that was really helpful to see some parts of the book just had no highlights at all. Um, and so they either, we just cut them or we dispersed them throughout the book if we thought we couldn't cut them, like they were too important or we just had to really improve them. <clears throat> some parts were really green. So, you know, kept them, did more like that. And that changed the book a lot. Um, but it's very time consuming because you have to email back and forth with individual people and, and read individual documents and, and things. Um, you didn't use like a shared Google doc or something for, for those kinds of feedback. So I considered that, but I think there's a few problems. One is that we um, didn't want people to prejudice one another with what they've written. Um, or if you're say like a, a student, which we had many students reading it, we didn't want them to feel nervous about other people reading what they'd written. Right. Um, and also, I don't think you can double highlight a Google Doc. I guess yeah. you could double comment on something maybe, but I don't think there is a program that does it. Um, 
it's like a some in beta uh, ding 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 uh, some in beta software um which i probably possibly should have used but i thought it might confuse i can't remember what it's called but it's just like a really small web app and um i thought it would confuse physios to be honest because even google yeah. Docs is quite hard for some physios to use because they're just not used to it so yeah yeah um, okay so just um to kind of recap a little bit so i'm trying to get my head around the, what you're doing so you you start off like you you're reading and you're making notes all the time and now you're at the same time you're having this ongoing parallel conversation with a colleague and you keep finding yourself coming back to this this one idea and then you decide okay well this is a book um so while you're taking notes you're not necessarily taking notes with the intention of writing a book but you're taking notes you know that these notes are going to become something. They're going to be a newsletter or, you know, so they're going to be useful. Um, so you're reading with purpose, um, but you're not reading for the book. But then at some point you decide that you're going to write the book. You've got this pile of notes. And now does your reading take a more targeted approach where you, because you've got your framework, you say mm. you've got this pile of notes and you, you're using Rome to take existing notes and put them into a, a, a framework that you're now going to fill in the gaps. Um, and now your reading has a purpose where you're going to try and read to fill in the gaps. And at the same time, you're also constantly shuffling things around um, until you get a narrative that feels like it makes sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Then you focus on that narrative for a while until you feel like, okay, this is something that is potentially a coherent argument. And then that's the version that you send out to all of your critical readers. Mm. Is that kind of a process that you followed? Yeah, uh, yeah. And and I think you know, as you said, that there is once you know what you're doing, there's some more targeted or structured reading and note taking. So I just have Zotero open, and I just read every single in order from 1890 to 2022, every single paper about quadrupinus syndrome that isn't ridiculously obscure. Um, read every single one and um you know and that will that will add uh, many of the main ones have actually already re read of course but it's kind of this diligence thing you have to do and and there'll, there'll always be things you can pull out or nice quotations that you haven't noticed and then uh and then yeah so, so organizing it um that's interesting when when you when you've got that massive collection of articles that's going back you know, I don't know, 130 years or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so now you've got all of the articles. Uh, you're reading through all of them. Is this a massive scoping review where you're just saying everything comes in, you're not going to do any kind of analysis of methods, or is it more like a systematic review where you, you read something and then you realize, okay, I can't take any of this seriously because – you know, the sampling methods that they used were, you know, inappropriate or whatever. Mm. So are you, are you excluding articles or are you saying, no, 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 everything is potentially a, a useful article to be included? There's no formal process because, um, and I, I'm not an academic. Um, and I think that's like a key thing that you, you complimented me, which I appreciate by saying, or, or, or like aligning me with academics. Like I'm definitely not. Um, I've, I've done a little bit of second, like, um, I've done a literature review, which was peer reviewed. And, um, I feel like that gave me a, a little bit of kind of training for want of a better word. Um, and I learned a lot from doing that actually. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm more, more looking at an article to say, is this going to be useful to me? So some very unrigorous, especially older trials and articles will be really, really interesting because they are often more descriptive. Um, and so you can pull out a nice quotation or they'll say something that might not be thoroughly evidence-based, but it's valuable because it was the perspective of a consultant who's seen thousands of patients or something. So, um, but you don't see it in articles these days. So like one, in, I'm trying to think of a good example about cord requirement syndrome. It was a while back, but so yeah, I, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, but it's more like the, the ends is not um, not an academic ends. It's a right, useful book and, and a readable yeah. book. And 
Um, but of course, you know, when it comes to, of course, like I have, you know, far less than a professional academic, but I still have them little modules in my head of like, you know, is this randomized? What's the sources of bias? And then, and so on. Yeah. I'm not doing it in any structured way. When it comes to writing more formally about treatments and sur surgical treatment and things, I, I will do that. But I think especially with something like cord equina syndrome, you know, there's what we're talking about. And one of the reasons we chose it actually is because it is very, it's still very much locked up in craft or tacit knowledge, like what we have to do about this thing. And maybe one day there'll have been enough money and enough research that we can kind of do trials on the best way to screen for it. But at the moment it is still in expert knowledge territory. Um, that's an interesting question, but um, short, short answer is no, not, not very systematic about it. Possibly. Yeah. yeah. No, no, I was, uh, I, maybe just to, to clarify, um, I, I would definitely classify what you're doing as scholarship, not necessarily academic research. Uh, yeah. um, and so like for me, scholarly practice is, uh, well, there's a, a few different frameworks that you can use, but, you know, it's about discovery, integration, um, I think, uh, teaching and um, oh, there's another one. Uh, so there's there's four things, and I think what you're doing is not necessarily the scholarship of discovery. You're not doing your own empirical research, mm. um, but it absolutely is about integration. So taking existing knowledge and putting it in a different format, um, sharing it for a different audience, uh, teaching. This this is all like scholarly activity, mm. um, and it's interesting that you kind of you kind of mentioned that, which kind of means me uh, I'm kind of trying to articulate uh, something that's been on my mind for a while. But a few days ago, I was telling someone that about three or four years ago, I shifted the focus of my interest as an academic to look squarely at scholarly practice rather than research. Mm -hmm. And so my publications have dropped, but my other areas of scholarly practice have mm -hmm. increased. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, I get, I get way more pleasure out of doing that work. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems to be, resonating with more people than any of the papers I've ever published have done. Mm -hmm. um, so I definitely think that the work that you're doing is scholarly. Yeah. Um, and, and I, you know, I was asking about the, um, the types of reviews, um, not, not to suggest that there should be more rigor applied to it, because I think yeah. anyone can do a systematic review on, on, you know, the available evidence. Mm. I think it's about exactly like you're saying, you can, read a really old paper that's more descriptive. It's not the RCT or, or an experimental trial, but there may be a really beautiful description. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, you know, you, uh, if you think about Einstein's paper on relativity, um, there was no empirical work. It was, you know, him saying, imagine you're sitting on a light beam. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, there's no chance that's getting published today. <laughs> um, so, you know, there was some beautiful work that was done, you know, basically with people just writing amazing descriptions of what they were observing in practice and then trying to come mm. up with reasons for why they might have observed that. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think I see things from a similar perspective, uh, and I will definitely be adding scholar to my Twitter bio. Um, <laughs> but no, that's I, I've not heard that distinction between academic and, and scholar before, and that's a nice little... Um, a nice little perspective i haven't i haven't heard yeah, yeah. Um, I, i'm in a big drive to bring scholarship into academia and you know like research is fine um but unless you are in a research track um it's really hard to do research but anyone can be a scholar mm -hmm. um scholar is just about uh, thinking carefully about the work that you're doing mm -hmm. um cool mm -hmm. i like that yeah so um, so once you, um, I, I think I commented on Twitter with uh, your, the idea about sending out the, the documents and getting, and getting all that feedback. Mm. Um, do you feel like that was a collaboration with a group of people or was it more instrumental where, you know, they had a purpose and um, they, they made a contribution? Um, I'm just trying to think because it, it kind of, it, it's not quite there, but it kind of feels like you're touching almost like on an open science, mm -hmm. um, open research approach. 
it's not quite the same because it's not like you're sharing a data set and then you know asking people to to make an intellectual contribution um there it was more editorial um in terms of you know from from what i'm gathering um from what you've described um but I, I, I just, I think I commented on Twitter, just saying like, this is amazing. Uh, you know, it really would be wonderful if more people were sharing work in mm. an earlier stage of writing. Um, and I just, you know, what was that process like? Were people, were people honest? Um, you know, was it more negative? Was it more positive? Were people reluctant to tell you what they didn't like? I, I just love to hear more about that that process. Um, it was. Um... Yeah, it was very rewarding um, and it was nice to kind of connect with people. That all sounds very corny, but like, you know, you know that, you know, I know people read my stuff, but it's it's not, um, people very rarely will tell you that they've read it and even more rarely will kind of engage with it explicitly online. Um, so to actually do that with people and work with them was really, really nice um and um yeah it was i i thought of it as more i'd like to say it was kind of like a crowd what crowd sourcing or like open science or something and um i i don't think it was quite that far in that direction i was thinking of it as more like product testing um so my limited knowledge of of like if you have an app or a website then you want to watch users use the app and see where they're getting stuck and you know um and i thought of it as much more like that um so i was looking at where yeah where are people so so obviously many people didn't finish the book or where are they stopping so many people stopped after part one because the beginning of part two was really dry so it's saying like how, what's their journey through the book like and, and how can we make it um as easy as possible um in terms of um, working with people, so there was a huge spectrum of types of contributors and there were like a handful of people who were very experienced with, with exactly what we were writing about and not at all the target audience for the book <laughs> um, and really knew what we were saying already. Um, and they were very useful. A few of them pointed out papers and things that we hadn't read or said, this is not really quite right. Um, uh there were and not it was generally a very smooth process um i can't think of anything that was really went wrong or was annoying uh, obviously like a handful of people didn't really even open it or start which is absolutely fine that's what you expect um most people finished it uh some people i guess a handful of people didn't really maybe made suggestions that um we were never going to accept so um stumbling a bit but um i think you know a lot of people don't really understand or or don't think about the the limits of of a book so like you have to it has to be limited in scope and like very or at least we're deliberately not writing a textbook so it has to be limited in scope and focused throughout um and you have to pass this world of information down or pare it down to. Um, so there was a few people who were kind of like, well, you've missed out this, or you've missed out this bit of nuance, or you haven't mentioned um, the, my particular special interest. Couldn't you do a chapter on that? That's always going to be the case. And and it's like, that's all me meant with the best of intentions, but it, you kind yeah. of, you, ha you have to say like, it's just, that would take me a month to do and no one cares except you about it. So, you know, <laughs> I can't do that, you know? Yeah. But I guess that's the importance of having a well-scoped project to begin with. And, you know, it, whether it's a book or, or any kind of project that, or even building software, there's feature bloat and, you know, things, mm -hmm. if you let them, will just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. You need a, you need a stopping point where you say, you know, this far and no further. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, cool. The, of course, sorry, the, the, again, there were also, I'm just trying to cast my mind back times when people disagreed about the same thing. So a lot of people wanted, oh, we need more signposting. Tell me where we're going. And a lot of people said, stop telling me where we're going with the book. Like, you don't need to tell me. I trust you. Just talk. Um, and um, 
you know, little things like that. And again, you just have to kind of balance, balance the argument. Yeah. Yeah. Um, at the end of the day, yeah, I, I can be a bit vague in my answer, but it was, it was just like a very sort of practical incremental process of writing a lot of, and reading a lot of emails and a lot of comments and responding to them. And yeah, it made the book just totally different from how it was. Um, yeah. So it must have been worthwhile. Yeah. No, I just thought I really wanted to know more about that process because it was the first time I've seen somebody do something like that. You know, usually you write, you send it to an editor and the editor will work through the book with you, but it's yeah. not going out to a bunch of kind of A-B testers. Yeah. Um, although I suppose A-B testing isn't exactly what you did, but yeah. you know, that people, are, people are looking at it and, and giving you feedback, which is really great. Yeah. And then just kind of wrapping it up with um, the editing process. Did you just kind of rely on your, your own editing skills? Did you use any anything like... I don't know, Grammarly or any software tools? Did it go to a professional editor? Just layers of different things. So I, by the, actually the um, the test read was really good for that as well. So I said to them at the beginning explicitly, please don't crack my grammar. Not that I don't appreciate it, but that's not what this is about. Because I think that's what people think when they please read this. They want, you know, they think that you want a sort of proofreader, but um, but actually, many of them did still pick up on that stuff because it's really easy just to highlight it. And that was really useful. So that the fact that, you know, 40 people had read it before, other than me, you know, um, caught a lot of stuff. Um, and then there's the fact that I'm reading it and rereading it. I send it to my parents, who are both good readers, um, like uh, careful. They just both have an eye for detail. So that helped. And um I would love to have paid for a proofreader, but um, I didn't, it wasn't really in the budget. Um, yeah. So we paid for a cover, for a front cover, um, and I paid what to me is a lot of money for that. And people really love the cover. Um, and I thought, well, I can't really afford a, a proofreader. And I was a bit worried about working with them as well. Like um, what, because I know I didn't want to pay for the wrong proofreader and get into debates about like, they think a, hyphen should be used this way and I think it, you know I was a bit worried about all that so in the end I think there are a couple of typos in the book which I've now corrected because it's print on demand so you can just correct it um yeah I think there were a couple of typos in the first sort of batch that went out but um oh and Grammarly yes I did use and it picked up one or two things but it also picked up a, a lot of things that I just had to ignore do you use Grammarly yeah um, I use an open source tool called uh, Language Tool, okay. um, and I'm I'm undecided about whether or not it's it's especially useful. They tend to have their own preferences about what right is, um, which in many cases is subjective. And you know, like you, I I don't need to spend hours trying to figure out you know exactly where the comma goes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in my style of, of writing, you know, it, it kind of mimics, depending on who I'm writing for, but I want it to sound a little bit like my voice and, you know, and then tools like that start breaking down because they, they're not especially useful. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think for, for doing kind of a once over, you know, very quickly identifying some of the most obvious errors, I think they can be useful. Yeah. yeah. Um, what is the print on demand service that you use? Uh, it's called Lulu. Yeah, I know Lulu. Um, yeah. I've looked into that. Um, okay, cool. So that's the main one that I know about. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. You happy with it? Should work well? Yeah, it's excellent. Yeah. It's yeah. Um, the, is it excellent? I mean, there's pros and cons. So the pros are it works. We've had no quality control issues. Um, I think we've had one missing order, which I suspect, you know, they were out and I don't know. But, um, we've had a, we had one missing order that hasn't been resolved and a handful of missing orders that were just ended up as, yeah, it was left at the desk or something and it went to the wrong place okay. and that wasn't the company's fault, but the company chased, <clears throat> excuse me, chased them up really promptly. They're really prompt, um, which is weird because the reviews are terrible. The reviews online are about how bad customer service is, but I guess that's just a selection bias. My experience has been really good. Um, the, it, the only, downsides are the time so particular countries i think one guy it took like five weeks to get to saudi arabia because it got stuck at customs and they don't have a press in right. saudi arabia in the first place um so i've had to put like 
I send an email out to people after they buy it to say, please note that delivery time such and such. Um, because people are used to Amazon now, they're used to getting the thing. Yeah. yeah. And then the cost, of course. So, like depending on where it's printed, and it's a little bit sensitive, but each book costs about seven dollars to print plus a one dollar fifty service fee because I have it like automated. Um and that means I have to price the book at £25 before postage and packaging, which takes up to almost £30. Um, okay. So that's a big downside because £30 is a lot of money psychologically. It, well, it's just a lot of money. Um, yeah. But then we haven't got the ebook out yet. And when we get that out, then it'll be more available to people who bulk at the £30. But okay. Um, I think Luli's been very good. Um, we're certainly going to use it in the future. Yeah. Okay. It's not great. Oh, we only have two minutes before Zoom kicks us out, but yeah, it's um, it's not obvious that it was it maybe is this is it, it's not obvious that it was worth doing a print copy financially. Okay, yeah, but, that makes sense. Um, the PDF, a PDF or an ebook, you can have the same um or greater profit margin, and yeah. so much less fuss involved in setting it up and maintaining it keeping your eye on it even though lulu basically does everything i still have to like look regularly and chase up some stuff yeah um but i think probably in terms of the longevity of the book and stuff it, it's worth it existing in the physical world um but yeah. if it's purely about business and um then it, i'm not totally sure it's worth it i'm not sure about that one yeah do you think do you think you might want to do an audiobook yeah, so I looked into that, and um, uh, if we get kicked out, will we just hop on the call again? My Zoom is running out. I have one minute, but... No, that's fine. We can wrap it up. The short answer was that Amazon owns so much of that market that the, the, the only... It was either through Amazon and they keep the profits if you want to get it on Audible, and there's some like independent people that have their own apps to listen to audiobooks, but they look clunky and I'm not sure I really want to yeah. pay, use them. So then you say, well, can you send out just an MP3 file, which you could do, but I don't think put, customers would be very happy. They're used to having something on audible. I'm not sure they'd be very happy to receive an MP3 file. So yeah, maybe yeah. in the future, but I don't, I don't think it's that yeah. would take a lot of time. I think, or what yeah. do you think? As you say, the, the, the amount of time that you're going to invest in it, it may not make it worthwhile. And mm -hmm. as you say, you're, you're in this, um you know that this is your 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 business yeah. um so you need to kind of do that um cost benefit analysis mm. anyway tom we we're out of time yeah. um so i really appreciate it thanks for taking us through the the yeah. beginning to the end of of your book um it's yeah. really interesting